Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 749th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe, the Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Loie Hollowell, Harminder Judge, and Jason Rosenfeld. We're thrilled to welcome poet Leah Dorkin here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter, and here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land that we're speaking from. And now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce today's guests and host. Lowy Hollowell's vibrant and evocative paintings exist between abstraction and representation, referring to human bodies as sites of sensuality and sexuality, desire and disgust, pleasure and pain. Hollowell's paintings are at once personal and universal in their fierce vulnerability, her use of symmetry, often anchoring her compositions in a central singular axis, evokes the body and the natural world. Hollowell lives and works in New York. Harminder Judge's work explores processes of spiritual and material transformation. Judge draws from a diverse array of sources, from a funeral pyre on his family's farm in rural Punjab, India, to the rebuilding of a 1930s bungalow in South Yorkshire, England. With references to the abstract expressionists, to color field, and to the traditions of neo-tantric painting, Judge's works negotiate the boundaries of color, form, and composition to create portals that bridge the physical and metaphysical. Judge lives and works in London. And our host today, distinguished chair and professor of art history at Marymount Manhattan College, Dr. Jason Rosenfeld, has curated several notable exhibitions, among them John Everett Millay at Tate Britain and Van Gogh Museum, and pre-Raphaelites, Victorian avant-garde at Tate Britain and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. He's a co-author of the monograph Cecily Brown and a senior writer and editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. And with that, it's my absolute pleasure to pass it over to Jason. Thank you so much, Chloe. Um, it's great to be here again. Uh, thank you, Loi, and thank you, Harminder, for joining me. Uh, today and all of us on the new social environment. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Both sides of the Atlantic today. Well, yeah. I guess there are a lot of sides, of the Atlantic, but we, we're coming from ac across the pond um, as well. So today, just let me say, uh, welcome everyone to the 749th edition of the Brooklyn Rail New Social Environment. Um, for GE, I just want to note that in terms of the home run race, we are six home runs now behind Hank Aaron, who finished out at 755 home runs. Pretty good achievement. Uh, thank you to Chloe and Eleanor and Fong and the rest of the team at The Rail. Um, thank you to uh, Emily and Claire at Pace for the help that they have afforded us in putting this all together. Thank you also to Dora from um, Lowy's studio. And welcome also to uh, Leah, our poet, who's with us today. Um, and thank you to Ruby for letting us borrow her dad for a little bit here for this talk. Um, so uh, I went to the preview of this press preview of this exhibition, and I'll share screens so you can see what we're looking at. Uh, here's the title page. Notice, I mean, I'm in black and white. You guys are in color because it makes total sense. As you will see, color is the thing uh, in, in some respects in this show, um, as everyone will see. Uh, the show is called Love Letter, uh, curated by Loie and Harminder, and it's on view at Pace 540, the big one on West 25th Street uh, in, on, the, um, on the second floor right now. Uh, bookended by Tara Donovan and um, and David Hockney, seems appropriate. And um, here's the space as you see it when you first walk in. So I went to the uh, press preview, seems like long ago now, and was so jazzed up by what I was seeing, I immediately got in the face of the artists and asked if they would do an NSE with me. Um, and they 
instead of calling security, uh, were actually very amenable to the idea, uh, having heard them talk about what they've been doing. So I was, I'm really pleased that both of you have agreed to do this and share um, what you've been up to in this project with everybody. And of course, it's a curatorial project to one degree, because you're selecting works um, to display. And there's not a lot of uh, uh, didactic content, which is refreshing, I expect, for some for some of us. Um, but there's an interview which will be published, I think, uh, later this month, right? By I hope Pace. So. Yeah, I hope a so. pamphlet, pamphlet about the show. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to talk a little bit about what's it about, what it's about, but also it's remarkable for, for being an opportunity for everyone to see new work by Loey and also see work by Harminder. Who hasn't shown in New York, so it's it's a it's a great treat. And um, as you can see here, you have a wide array of different objects here, but the the focus is on two other artists now deceased: uh, Agnes Lawrence Pelton, who died in 1961. There she is on the left in a very Fendisiac Golden Dawn kind of uh, photograph. She's looking very serious. Um, and then uh, and then on the right is Gulam Razul Santosh, uh, 1929 to 1997. So maybe you two can just start by talking a little bit briefly about how this came about and who these artists are, um, these artists from the past. People may know Pelton a little bit. Pelton, just to interject for a second, uh, was slated to have a, a retrospective at the Whitney Museum um, down the street from here, here in the West Village uh, in 2020. And of course it happened, but because of COVID, it was not as visible as it should have been. So yeah. it was a kind of a missed opportunity. But if you go to the Whitney now, you could see works of hers on view in the permanent collection. And, and she has become more of a present, more presence more recently. Santosh, I had no idea who he was, even though I'm supposedly an expert in British art um, and art of the British colonies and uh, the larger, larger Commonwealth. Never heard of him. So I was really interested to see this kind of pairing. So why don't you two just give us a little bit of backstory to the show and talk a little bit about who these artists were. Um, <clears throat> I can start and talk about how I discovered because discovering Harminder was also an experience for me. I hadn't yep. um, seen his work and I was perusing the White Cube website and saw this beautiful shaped sculpted piece and um, like one of the pieces, like a few of the pieces in the show. And yeah. I just, I, I wanted to buy it. I wanted to find out how to buy it. So I reached out to White Cube and they gave me his contact. And we started a conversation, which turned into the show. I think the conversation started almost a, more than a year and a half ago, Harmander. Do you remember? Yeah, it's not far from two years. Yeah. So in our first kind of iteration for the show, we were thinking really about light space, color, line. We were thinking about it very formally. So we, we had other artists we wanted to show. We were thinking of like um, having Agnes Martin, Lawrence Miller Pierce, Bearden Day, another um, uh, tantric, neo-tantric painter. Do you recall who else we were, we were considering? It was kind of a larger- Yeah, there was like, like Prafula you know, Mahanti and maybe, yeah, some of the light and space artists and maybe um, uh, more of the transcendental painting group artists. Yeah. We, mm -hmm. we were really interested in the, in the idea that the neo-tantric painting movement in India seemed to have so much in common with maybe the um, transcendental painting group in the States and even yeah. the light and space artists. And even, yeah. even people like Kandinsky who wrote concerning the spiritual on art, talking about abstraction being um, a gateway into speaking about the ineffable. So we were like, okay, this is incredible. Like why, why has there not been an exhibition of people like Birindi, Profuna Mahanti, G.R. Santosh with, these amazing American painters who all seem to share DNA. And we were like, has this been done? We don't think it's been done. We did a bit mm -hmm. of digging. And so it began as this big thing. And then the more and more Loie and I talked about it, the more and more we were kind of coming at it from a very personal uh, um, kind of almost introspective 
perspective where we were like, okay, well, we're not museum curators, we're not academics, we're not art historians. So if we really had to write, let's say a love letter across time and space and geographies uh, and to two artists, who would they be? Like, who would we pick? And it really got distilled down to Pelton and Santosh. They're, yeah. they're the two who we feel are most in the DNA of, of our work. And I, I discovered Santosh's work, actually, when I was at the Strand, I found this exhibition catalog from 85 from UCLA, a UCLA show of all the, the uh, artists associated with the neo-tantric painting movement. And so I, I looked up each of them. And then when I came up across Santosh's work, I, my mind was blown. I mean, he was doing all these things that I was thinking about. He was creating images where he would pair the female and the male goddesses and kind of have these, you know, intertwined forms. He was also, he had just like great vibrancy of color, you know, really clean lines, sensuousness, mm -hmm. like a fluid geometry. And he also used um, the shape of the mandorla, this like a football shape often as a kind of a symbol for vagina. He, he's never written that, but that's what I interpreted as, interpreted it as, and that's what I had been doing um, yeah, since I started that's, that's making beautiful. these new paintings yeah. in like 2014. So he kind of blew, he just blew my mind. And then Pelton I discovered, um, I didn't discover until 2016 when um, Fairfax Dorn of, Mar of Marfa Ballroom curated me into a show with, um, Transcendental Painting Group people and um, Dan Colon. And it was kind of a, a group show at their space. And then her work just blew me away too because of the, the softness of the line, the beauty of the, the white, her use of white light, hmm. um, her hard lines kind of moving into her soft lines, the unabashed use of kind of cartoony images. It's just very, it's very honest. It feels very honest. When did you come across these painters, Harminder? Pelton, I came across much later than Santosh. I've been a big Santosh fan for a long time. Not quite sure when I discovered his work, but I definitely like, when I first saw his work, I was kind of, I saw his like, his body of neo-tantric work, which looks really geometric, uh, formally composed, very symmetrical, has this dissecting line down the center of the canvas and then the piece kind of unfolds like a I don't know like a like other portals like a door or a or a doorway or a book and I just found them really trippy and incredibly beautiful and I didn't know anything about the um, uh, the neo-tantric movement I knew a little bit about tantric philosophy I'd read a book called Agori um I mean, like Tantra is huge, right? There was this big exhibition at the British Museum that delved a little bit into Tantric, um, the history of Tantric work in India. But it's 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 a, a massive body of knowledge that's kind of subversive. Um, and, you know, he's a neo-Tantric painter. So, um, you know, he was making his most amazing work, I think, in the 60s and 70s. So not mm -hmm. that long ago, you know, really not that long I mean, Pelton was making her work before then. And then Pelton, maybe I got turned on to it because of the Whitney show and then a friend sent it on to me and I delved into it and I found it equally very seductive in the initial viewing, which I think is wonderful about all of this work. It has an initial seduction, which kind of brings you in and then it unfolds this kind of deeper revelatory meaning that's behind the seduction and you're like wow god this is like phenomenal yeah. um so yeah I think with her work you know some of it is kind of like Disney-fied and there are like kind of stars and kind of glittering landscapes and but then you go beyond the pale and you just see how um how she made a lot of the a lot of this work from a from a deep rooted place that comes from like, I don't know, compulsion and this searching for um, a deeper meaning through making work. And she so was I also involved with Agni Yoga, which was this like new age 
kind of yeah, Americanified yeah, yeah. religion that was like taking inspiration from the East, from yeah, Eastern that religions. Was- yeah, that was like an offshoot of theosophy, wasn't it? Madame right. Blavatsky. Blav- Blav- but was- it was all about like universalism and like yeah. finding the joint energy of everyone and the joint yeah, light yeah, yeah, that yeah. comes out of love and beauty. Um, but I, but I, I vibe with Agni Yoga because they, they talk about fire as being like the ultimate force in the universe. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my work references. Um, oh, interesting. As, we, as we've talked about, Loi, like the funeral pyre yeah. that I for my great uncle in Punjab when I was a teenager and seeing like his body being obliterated by fire and turned into ash. And I just realized that fire is this incredible force that can break down um, a sentient body and turn it into matter again. So like Agni Yoga, I kind of vibe with in a way, even though it was a bit new, you know, the whole, like a lot of this stuff gets kind of, um, shoehorned into this like new agey stuff but there are there's like deep bodies of knowledge within a lot of this that that just go beyond that whole kind of new Mm -hmm. age i think another really sorry that's a kind of co-option right the new age co-option of it for other purposes you know and what i think is interesting and maybe we'll talk about uh the neo-tantric stuff in a little bit i just was wondering if they had coined that term that name themselves did they take that name or was it something that was sort of thrust on these artists who were actually separated a little bit geographically as I understand you know they're working yeah. in India I don't know if J.R. Santush even was happy about being associated with them I, don't um, know. I think it was more put upon them right so it often becomes yeah. a marketing thing or like yeah. the impressionist it's a pejorative you know that just get gets gets taken up Um, But, you know, when you're looking at works like these and for everyone on the left is when you go in the show, you turn left. This is what you see, the little corner um, hang of these two works. Uh, Lowy's work in the center, fully dilated. And on the right is a work by Pelton from 1946, kind of a later work, uh, Ascent. It's actually AKA Liberation. I wonder about that. The title changed at some point. 1946 Liberation feels like this uplifting post-war kind of painting at the end of so World sexual. War II. Yeah, but then Isn't Ascent. Isn't so sexual? It's sexual and it's also like All the, the assumption. sexual, right? The That's assumption, right? We're like, yeah, we're Sex like. everywhere. But I remember you saying, uh, uh, Loey, that you, you were actually thinking about this work, Ascent, um, in making uh, some of your pictures and in particular the new, the extraordinary thing, one in the center. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of Pelton's color, I, I just am so in love with. I think it's mm. feminine, but un, unabashedly feminine. And um, I just, I, I was really thinking about it with fully dilated and fully dilated. It's, uh, I was thinking about the pelvic, the shape of the pelvic bone. And so this pregnant belly is kind of in place of the, of a baby's head coming out, you know, during birth, coming out of the birthing canal. Um so in a way, it's an ascension, you know, an ascension into life from the primordial juices of the womb. Um, and also, I just, I love how sexual that painting is. I wonder if she thought about it that way, but that painting with the the ball sack and then this like mm-hmm. aggressive mm-hmm. phallic shape, like going into the ovum, I just yeah. find it really, um, really sensual. Also, it's like the phalluses on um, pan figures, uh, fi- classical figures of pan, who always have pointed penises. Right? They're, 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 well, they're half wild. They're meant to be you yeah. know, half human, half animal. Um, I remember you know, studying that in Hellenistic art consistently. And that's what I thought of when I saw this, that it's, you know, it's, ele- ele- it's elevating up, but it also has that mm. literally pointedness. But what, 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 what you'll see a lot in this show is like um, references to the to the microcosm and the macrocosm. You'll see it all, all over everyone's work. And when I saw this, first saw this work by Lowy, I also, you know, my partner just recently went through childbirth. So obviously I saw the crowning head, but I also saw something really planetary, you know, mm-hmm. really cosmic in it. And seeing this kind of planetary shape emerging out of what could be a kind of giant explosion in space. So there's there's all of this kind of pla- like microcosm macrocosm uh, references that we'll see in everything. This yeah. work is made out of oil paint, acrylic medium, aqua resin, and epoxy resin on linen 
over panel. So that's the that's the recipe. But can you talk maybe a little bit, uh, Loie, about how you construct these amazing things? And I tried to take some details where people can see the protrusion, you know, the sculptural quality of it, and also the differentiation in the surface. Um, different areas have very different kinds of surfaces and textures. Yeah, so I started this series of work when I was pregnant with my second child. Um, <clears throat> my husband took a body cast of me, a torso cast. Mm. And I wasn't thinking, we were first doing it just as a document, just to have for when I wasn't huge anymore. Um, and then he, he kind of really, I don't know, it kind of inspired me to incorporate them onto the canvas in some way. And he kind of helped me, he helped break them apart into, into shapes, like take the, take the breast as a shape, the belly as a shape, and kind of, I, I kind of over time tried to abstract them and make them more um, uh, planetary, like Carmander said. But mm -hmm. uh, this, this belly in particular was, um, my the the wife of my gallery director at Pace Cambria and uh, she had a beautiful belly and I you know perfect shape and so I started casting you know my friends bellies and have used all of you know, like five different friends of mm. mine uh their bellies in my paintings and their breasts um so yeah, with this painting, like I was saying I was just thinking about the 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 pelvic bone the 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 head, the, the belly being both a head, uh, an, er, an earthly form, um, mm. and the belly itself. And then so so this texture in the background is a, is a made with a scouring side of a sponge, you know, the green side of a sponge. Mm. And then the uh, belly itself is a, a swirling texture with like layers of different swirls. And I kind of started doing that when I was trying to mimic pubic hair. And then it just turned into this way to make really like chiaroscuro mark making. Yeah, it feels, it, it looks like clay almost. It looks like it should be tacky, like clay, yeah. like it's been formed. Mm -hmm. It's it's quite amazing. You go and, and then I'll it. use with these shapes, because it's really, because I'm like working with, um, you know, actual light and illusory light. When I get a shape this big, it, it's, there's a ton of, a ton of bright light that's hitting it and making a reflection, yeah. uh, like re, re, uh, reflecting off the surface. So there's a lot of wax medium in the paint to, to like dull right. it down and absorb the light. So you have highlights that are part of it, but then it also is catching the light in yeah. the in the display. Right. And I'm Fantastic. trying to trying to embellish that distinction of light and dark with and paint. And then there's these pulsing sort of rippling forms that, that are emanating from it. Um, That's the energy of birth, man. It's just yeah, in and out. I've seen pulsating. it twice. <laughs> it's I've intense. been lucky enough to see it twice and cut the cord. That's awesome. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, of course. So uh, light emanating. I mean, that's something that is inherent in both of your work. And the luminosity in these works is, is quite amazing when you see it in the gallery. So let's talk a little bit now about, about uh, Harminder's process. And you can see here is Harminder's painting, um, Untitled Sand, Song, and Soil. Again, 2002. It's a large picture, so I'm trying to give you a sense of that. And on the right is one of Santosh's uh, works, this one, Untitled from 1978, which is quite a delicate painting, but as everyone can see, it's very much uh, about uh, the body, the body as you see that there on the right. And maybe just talk Harminder for a second about Santosh and his you know, you know, texture and surface, and then we'll go back and look at your piece. Um, well, I mean, this is probably um, really emblematic of a Santosh. Mm -hmm. um he kind of he found his way to this style of painting through um working fastidiously as a young painter he was looking at cubism he was looking at a lot of uh, a lot of european modernism but also the history of indian painting and then you know later on when he had his maybe his spiritual reawakening maybe i'm not sure if you would call it that or when he just, I don't know, he kind of discovered Kashmir Shaivism and he like entered into that uh, body of knowledge and he started to think about, you know, the uh, the um, the female energy existing um, as this kind of creative force within um, this male energy, which he would talk about as being like this consciousness. 
Um, then he started to fuse those forms together. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you get a lot of these kind of male and female forms being fused in this kind of sexual cosmic harmony. Um, and then all of a sudden emerge these amazing geometric paintings, which like I've not seen anything quite as incredible. Um, so yeah, I mean, he was an incredibly accomplished, accomplished painter before he arrived here, a bit like Pelton. Like yeah. Pelton started her career kind of making portraiture, right? And was like- Landscape. You know, Art Institute yeah. and, you know, was was a really phenomenal painter, but then kind of sacked it all off and just went and lived first in a windmill and then in, in the desert in order to channel these deeper bodies of knowledge that she found to be much more um, interesting and important than mm. just being, you know, uh, uh, an everyday painter. Um, and the, yeah, the color in this painting is is amazing. It's such high color key and saturated. And her work, the color is often, like you were saying, Lo, it's very, there's a lot of white added to it. It's very, it's often very muted. It often, it gives a kind of scene which seems sort of at a remove um, and otherworldly. And Santosh's kind of like the, works are totemic. Like, They're right in your face. Yeah, I mean, Santosh writes a lot about color. I mean, nothing in this body of work, in the neo-tantric mm. body of work of Santosh's, nothing is like given over to chance, really. Like everything in the painting is symbolic, whether yeah. it's color, form, shape, uh, the, the geometry, the numbers within it, everything it has, has a deeper symbolic meaning. But so, but so it did in a lot of Pelton's work. I mean, she would do things like she, you know, stars in her work would reference Venus, you know, like everything had a symbolic meaning mm. like underpinning. Um, so, you know, he like nothing is by chance here. So he was, he, he seems really fearless with his color, right. but he was choosing them because of their symbolic meaning. Right. And then in your work, which is on a grand scale, um, and I'm showing you on the left, everyone can see the whole, all the whole piece. And on the right, maybe talk a little bit about your process in making these works. You describe your work as um, chaos on a table. Great line. Chaos <laughs> on a table. Um, and I yeah, assume that means you work, you work flat. On, you work flat. But just yeah. if people notice on the right, these are, in, they're, I don't know how to describe them because they're, they're reflective to a high degree, but they're not glassy reflective. So uh, it's hard to take a detail of them head on. You look on the side and you see there's a lot of reflectance, but it's a kind of muted reflectiveness. And then these details here of the left edge of the painting. So that's here just to orient people. And then here, the center, this crevice here in the center. So maybe can you talk a little bit about uh, your process. I'll read the list. It's plaster, polymer, pigment, scrim. My students were wondering what that was when I took them to the gallery the other day. And oil, plaster, polymer, pigment, scrim, and oil. And this is 92 inches high. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, they're effectively giant plaster reliefs. Um, so, you know, I have had... Um, you know, a bit of a kind of um, stop and start relationship with the art world, if you might want to call it like that. So, you know, I began making work as a performance artist and those performances were very large scale, very bombastic. But one of the performances that I um, toured for a number of years involved filling galleries with um, two and a half tons of unpasteurized cow's milk to form a stage. And upon that stage, there would be a kind of unfolding of uh, light um, uh, using lasers and LED park hands that you use in uh, the theater. And then like this kind of body would emerge out of this kind of um, big liquid stage. And the whole thing I thought about as like a giant color field painting. And then I kind of sacked off the art world for a number of years, went and did other things one of those things was rebuilding an old house um, in the north of England. And while I was rebuilding that house, dreaming about going back to an art practice, which I'd left behind, um, I remember like plastering the interior of the house and realizing that plaster is an incredible material because it's at once sculptural, painterly and performative. So, you know, you use it, you know, kind of in this performative action you have to work wet on wet and you can't stop 
until you like finish an area. Um, but it's also really sculptural. It's not like using, you know, an, an oil or, or an acrylic, um, but it's incredibly painterly. So I, I remember thinking like, okay, if I go back to making artwork, I want to use plaster as my material because not only does it bridge all of those uh, disciplines, but the, but the repetitive labor of plastering allows you to kind of meditate you know, like any kind of repetitive labor, labor can allow your mind to go to other places, which is some of the places that people like Pelton and Santos talk about. So, you know, I went back to school in 2017 and there I just dicked about with plaster for a couple of years and saw what I, you know, kind of felt out what I could get it to do. And eventually I arrived at these these works. And these works are made, you know, flat on a table. They're basically giant frescoes, kind of plaster reliefs where I work pigments into pools of wet plaster. And they're made like one panel at a time. So here, for example, if I make the left-hand panel, I have to do a certain movement in order to get that composition. And whatever I do on the left-hand panel, I have to mirror on the right-hand panel. So they're kind of rich, they're made very ritualistically, very performatively. Um, but obviously, I don't know if because I'm working face down, similar to how a reverse, an Indian reverse glass painter might might work. You work from the foreground to the background rather than a traditional painter where it's background to the foreground. I'm never quite sure what I'm going to get, so I kind of have to feel it out, you know. And the more I understand the material, the more I can manipulate it um the more the i try and manipulate the material the more, more the material just bangs me out and tells me it's not going to do that so, so what's that like bits of rope and other detritus in here is that so part of I, the plaster if you imagine like a if you imagine a flat table and i've poured plaster into the table uh onto the table <clears throat> into a clay wall that i've built around the perimeter of the table in order to mm -hmm. contain it like a pool once that first layer is dry i'll then put another layer of plaster on and i'll i'll strengthen that using scrim which is basically like a a, a hessian jute like a weaved fabric that's okay. been used in sculpture for uh, hundreds yeah. of years in order to give it strength Pla plaster reliefs and um uh, plaster sculptures in order to give it strength and then I'll put another layer in then another layer then another until it's strong enough for me to lift it off the table and reveal what I've been mm. working on huh. and if I if I you know when I reveal it um I don't know what I'm really going to get I can manipulate certain things but I'm kind of looking for a I don't know like a deep sense of order um, mm. I love this like Francis Bacon quote that I talk about a lot, which is um, he once said, um, I want a deeply ordered image, but I want it to come about by chance. Mm. Uh, and that's what I'm kind of trying to find in these. I'm trying to find some like deep order in the mess of this material, which is kind of what happens in the universe, right? <laughs> like yeah. it's just, and you know, the universe is just a mass of materials colliding and right. out of you that, see that at the bottom of this aerial colliding is like some kind of yeah. order you see that at the bottom with this sort of spray coming out of the it looks almost like primordial sort of spray coming out i have a, yeah. a couple questions on the on the strength of that um la last nsc that i did was with ryan sullivan who had a show at 125 newbury part of the yeah. pace system uh, last month and he also works face down so he doesn't know what it's going to look like until he takes his uh, resin paintings out of this little this tub that he's constructed and some of them he ditches they don't work mm. do you do you find that you are controlled enough in the process such that they when you take them off and you reveal it to yourself that they they're satisfactory or are you I try, I try and not ditch work so if if a piece if a piece doesn't work then I will try and reuse it in a, in another piece. Yeah. So yeah. like all of these all right. small uh, flex that you're seeing, that's an old work that that hasn't come together, and it's been smashed up 
put in a pestle and mortar, ground down into an aggregate, and then thrown huh. into a new work. Oh, okay. So you'll it's environmentalist. These- <laughs> there's a, yeah. I mean there, you know, there's still a lot of work that doesn't work or like the back of it might be made up of works that don't work because um, huh. they'll be ground back into an aggregate and reused in this kind of cyclical process um, and do you fiddle with the surface once you take it off the table oh my god the surface gets so much work once it comes okay. off the table okay yeah so the, so if once it when it comes off the table it feels almost archaeological like it's been dug out of the ground it's very rough it's very raw. It's quite soily. Yeah. And if I feel like there's a compositional order within this thing, um, and I put the two panels together and I feel like there's this kind of tantric power in them, what we talked about at the beginning, this symmetrical line going down the center and this unfolding of the work, almost like a book or um, a doorway, a portal, then... I'll then set about working the surface and the surface, you know, I will sand and sand and sand up to an insane grit, like 10,000 grit in order to give me this deep polish, Mm -hmm. kind of how you would work a piece of marble or a piece of stone. Yeah. And that will give that reflection that you talked about before, which allows the surface to stop being material. It allows you to look into it more rather than at the surface of it. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, a, I have to say, it's kind of, in a positive way, maddening, because there's no way to find what you expect to seek, brushstroke, right? There's no way to find facture. It doesn't exist, because it's seamless, like a, you know, like a, a countertop, in a sense. Yeah, people can't you know? get their head around what it is. Some people think they're digital. <laughs> Some people think yeah, they're, they're all on canvas. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's alchemy. Um, kudos to you curators for this little uh installation here you know it's one thing to put things next to each other on the wall but i love this juxtaposition juxtaposition on walls which are essentially perpendicular and you can really see you know that that, you know this is not a one-to-one relationship but the kind of harmony that's existing between uh your predecessors were in santosh and uh the picture we've just been talking about i really love this one on the left and of course the first thing and I bring loey back into this first thing that i uh, thought of when i saw santosh's paintings for the first time was mars and hartley mars and hartley that and of course not him necessarily specifically but this idea that you have artists who are working in india in the post-war era and who are really thinking about both tantrism and European and American modernism. And Hartley is our, our best, at, you know, I guess Hartley and Stuart Davis um, and you know, subsequently some other artists, but working there in this kind of mode and you know, not to connect them in terms of culture, Although Hartley did this really interesting series of these kinds of paintings about Pueblo art and Plains Indian motifs while he was living in Germany in the years leading up to the uh, second and in the early Second uh, World War, the sort of the culture of the American Indian. So I don't want to get people off track here. This is not about India, right? It's about the American Indians on the right. Um, But, you know, the way that they're working with color and symmetry and uh, organic form and natural form, mountains, bodies, right? I see it as so connected. I don't know if Santosh was aware of Hartley in particular, or was really just looking at the European uh, tradition because mm-hmm. the Americans were kind of discounted. Mm-hmm. He was Any looking thoughts? at Kandinsky and Cubism. Yeah, yeah. So he's looking at this sort of card carrying European mm-hmm. uh, abstract modernist, but you know- Probably the, what the, he could get his hands on in terms of books. Right. In terms of re- reproductions, yeah. the, the color keys, the symmetry, the play of forms, the the patterning and the planarity of it, I think that it's quite remarkable. Even though mm-hmm. the the content is obviously you know very different, but here are people who are trying to find a different expression for their complicated spirituality uh, mm-hmm. in the 20th century. At the same time, the one on the That's left, I think, is is pretty remarkable. The painting on the yeah. left. I think it's um, one of my favorites on the show. Hmm. Yeah. What is the what are the things that really draw you to it, Louis? Um, <clears throat> I mean, for me, when you see it in person, those colors are just as rich as you're seeing them on the screen. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think his framing device is really interesting, the way he's framing it with these soft edges against a kind of a matte black. It really allows the colors to pop. The um, frames are original. <clears throat> Can I just ask that? I don't know. Are... 
Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. The frames within the frames we've seen. So that's part of what right. he's doing. But they're very, I have to say, they're very beautifully framed. Whoever yeah. did that, they're really beautiful framed, these works. I think what's what I'm really drawn to in this piece is he often has kind of hard edges in, mo in like most of the painting. And in mm -hmm. this one, he's found softer edges that are contrasted to these hard edges. So the hard edge smooth, smooths into this blending. And um, I think the body and the landscape kind of coming into the forefront and then moving into the background, this kind of um, blurring of background and foreground is really interesting. Um, <clears throat> the direct reference to the, the bodily kind of female spread legs is really interesting, kind of turning into mountains. Mm. Um, there's a there's a beautiful bit um because we were talking about the the edges of his canvas there being surrounded by this kind of soft um edges of his of a lot of his compositions have this kind of this dark border this kind of dark mm. uh, obsidian border around them and there was a uh, in the essay about the exhibition by Charlotte Jansen she picks up on that and she talks about it really beautifully and she she says that Santos referred to them as like the surrounding dark ocean around mm. his work and that it signifies the the ever unfathomable, unreachable of the fundamental unfathomable. Um, so mm. he talks about this kind of edge around his canvas as being like the universe beyond, right? Like, uh, which I think there's a few examples in this show of that, uh, which is really lovely. Yeah, I mean, it's also just really interesting as a formal device, um, yeah. especially when you get the hard edge frame around the outside, which is, you know, I don't know if that was intentional, but it's the kind of frame within the frame. Um, yeah. And it kind of makes them into portals. Yeah, and I see that in your work a bit, you know, Loi, like on the right here, that there's a, a kind of framing element in the almost like pendentives, as if you're looking up mm -hmm. at a dome squinches mm -hmm. on the dome on in the cornering uh in this really uh, unphotographable work on the right mm -hmm. i tried um blue o with red halo from 2022 and it's hung next to this uh, equally exquisite pelton from 1960 61 and this is the pelton which uh, you couldn't get i couldn't get details of it where there's lots of pencil writing on it there's lots mm -hmm. of like underdrawing and almost like notations that she's writing yeah. to herself and i like how you two talk about in your dialogue uh, on the in the Pace publication, the idea that the paintings that you've chosen of Pelton's are works that she made for herself. They were not commissions. They were not works that tourists could buy in the American Southwest. They were not portraits, right? These are paintings which were important to her to make for her. Well, she she you know she made portrait paintings on the side to make money. Yeah. She was in Cathedral yeah. City in uh, Southern California. She was making these paintings that we're seeing for herself primarily. I mean, they were mm -hmm. getting attention by the, the TPG, but they weren't, um, you know, they weren't like, you know, selling out, um, yeah. or, you know, and um, so I think this painting is really interesting because of those notations on this, on the painting. I think she might've actually done two versions of this painting. And I think this huh. is one of her last paintings she ever did, if not her last painting. So uh, I right. wonder if those marks were kind of left there before her passing, before she was able to finish it. I don't know. Hmm. But um, also, yeah. there's also this I, kind of floating cosmic egg within that work, no? Yeah. Which is right a beautiful symbol for like the last painting she ever made before she died to have this kind of, um, you know, levitating kind of transcending cosmic yeah. egg. It's really pre Kubrick, pre pre Stanley Kubrick, pre two thousand one, mm -hmm. a space odyssey. You know the yeah. like womb like form and the and the, the yeah. body in it, but you see that sort of hovering there um, yeah. on the left. And then here's Lowy's work uh, from the side, so you can see this. I don't know how well you you can describe it for us. Uh, the the projection here, the bit that's in relief at the bottom. Yeah, so I started making these paintings after my dad had a traumatic brain injury and he he's not able to speak anymore but um I was thinking of how to communicate with him visually and kind of giving him some kind of uh meditative 
image to look at while he was in his hospital bed for so long. Um, so I was kind of thinking of, of these as like brain spaces, spaces of the brain that's kind of been discombobulated. Like what, what is the true thing that you can focus on when you've kind of lost your ability to speak? Um, and uh, sorry, what? there's like talking in the back. Is that me? No, I think it's talking me. In the back? Sorry, oh, go me. ahead. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I was thinking of these as brain spaces and also just kind of portals into another world as well as portraits. So the bar at the bottom, I was kind of thinking of shoulders kind of holding up this um, abstract head. And, but it also works as kind of a landscape device kind of sitting in the foreground that's, you know, you have to kind of walking through to get to this um, deep space of the orb or of the, the concave, uh, yeah, the concave oval. And um, yeah, I really like it. It's funny, I wasn't thinking about, I wasn't thinking about light center when I was making the painting. And I think that's one of the really interesting things that happened in this curation of the show like we we didn't have access to a plethora of of Pelton's work. Like she has shows going on everywhere right now. She's got a beautiful show at the Crocker Arts Center. Um, she's got a, with another with the Transcendental Painting Group, but she's got some amazing paintings in Sacramento at the Crocker Art uh, Museum, and uh, she's just in high demand right now. So these were like the paintings we were able to get from the people, the, from the few people who were able to loan them. But this thing happened when we started curating it, and the same, the same with with Santush. Is they just these connections, like the one you pointed out with Harmander's work, these connections just started happening, and we and it kind of proved to us that that our love, our love had like transcended the actual, um, the actual kind of physical picking of the work. Like it just it was there intrinsically there, and. Um, so we got to have these amazing situations like this, like the Harmander piece com combination you just showed in this one, um, where the blues just somehow matched up. I was mm. thinking, um, I was thinking very clearly about. I made there's there's a painting in the show called um, Rose and Palm by Pelton, and I was thinking I made I made my painting Mother's Milk in purple, red, and yellow in blue thinking about that painting. So that that was a combination. That was the one combination that was set in my mind. I don't know yeah. if you have images. It's interesting those, the way you're talking about these paintings and especially this one, uh, Loie, which, which was meant for your dad, a sort of meditative um, yeah. work in a way, because I know Harmander, Harmander, you had some watercolors that were used in early COVID and put in spaces where people who were working, essential workers in the NHS, the National Health Service, were there to kind of calm them down or bring them down. And, you know, there's, right? Some of your watercolors, oh, wow. which are yeah, similarly man. Orphic That's and a deep cut. abstract. That's a deep cut. Yeah. I'm, I'm impressed with your research. Thanks but for I bringing think, that up. Yeah, yeah that was I a think, lovely project. It was a great project, right? But I think that something about abstraction and connecting and people written in the chat, the idea of the outside the rational, that this is, you know, not threateningly irrational, but that there's something about this that is connecting with people on a, on a different level. And, you know, I think uh, as we're maybe moving out of a period in art where figuration is king and queen at the same time, where you can talk about abstraction as something that better connects now uh, in an era of, you know, a kind of uncertainty. And you talk about portals, but that idea of we're at a gateway moment, where are we heading into the future? Future is always uncertain, end is always near, right? But the idea that we're at a, at a threshold moment right now, which you've talked about, uh, both of you have talked about, um, you know, these pictures seem to encapsulate that really beautifully. I think that's, I think yeah. that's, the, that's the strength of abstraction. But it's also it's also I, for me I, it's essential it's like these are paintings like especially this um you know the blue o these are paintings that i was using to meditate on my own loss you know my own experience of sadness around my dad's accident and you know getting to paint 
with color and space and light and texture and getting to dive into that through the pandemic was essential, like not having to attach my work to something didactic. Um, although I feel like my belly paintings kind of do go into a more kind of directive space. Um, but that was also important in helping me like process the experience of giving birth, which is just like the most traumatic and, and like mind shattering experience that anyone could go through. It's um, different. It's different, Loey, right? From essentialist art, right? And that, that's the point, I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like first wave feminist art in no. the 60s that, you know, it's different, even though it's the body is there, it's mm -hmm. different from the kind of essentialist art that people were doing, like Judy Chicago that was doing uh, in that period. I, I think that's, well, I, I think I, we, I that's we're a, putting that's a real strength. Yeah, I mean, we're putting ourselves into the work, Harminder and I, we're putting our bodies He's doing it physically, and this painting in particular, it's the it's it's, it's the the or the oval itself is almost six feet tall. So I'm making these movements like this, mm -hmm. swirling, 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 moving my body. I mean, they're the most exhaustive paintings I've made to date. Um, so we're putting our bodies and our and our energy into these paintings, in yeah. you know, in a way that I feel like Pelton and Santush did in like a really honest, sincere way. Um, there, there, there's also a, a, a language that they can speak, which can only be spoken through abstraction, which is like the the language of the ineffable, right? It's like it's hard to do that through illustration, figuration, um, you know, because that always ties you, it always anchors you to a certain thing. And abstraction like frees you of that thing. It allows you to enter into these realms that are much more open-ended. And which I think is why it's so successful at crossing borders and cultures and times. You know, that's why we're now rediscovering or discovering like early abstract painters who were who were really connecting to, because you know, they're they're speaking a language that still makes sense to us. Yeah. I mean, I think it's abstraction too that's that's coming out of the figure and landscape. Like it's I think all the work in the show has that element of abstraction through the space of landscape and and yeah. um, portraiture. And, yeah. um, you know, one of the reasons that Agnes Pelton left New York was to really explore that kind of personalized abstraction, but she never really got away from her, her history and landscape painting. And I feel the same for Santush, you know, he has this rich history of, of painting the landscape yeah. And um, that's always present in the work. Yeah. Especially yeah, in this painting, Harmander. Like, look at this landscape. Yeah, these are these are amazing. I, you know, these if I'm trying to give people a sense of what they look like, they're kind of skateboard sized works, um, <laughs> which are a little a little bit like uh, they're a little bit um, uh, concave, uh, as you can see here. And they're made using plaster polymer, pigment, scrim and oil, similar material, but on a smaller scale. And they certainly have landscape elements. But just to let me be an art historian for another minute, if you don't mind, um, you know, it, it, it was extraordinary to look at some of the uh, tantric pa tantra paintings from the 17th century in Rajasthan. Um, I know uh, Santosh was Kashmiri, but this from Rajasthan, these it, it, amazing things being made in the, the Baroque era, what we think of as the Baroque era, but no, yeah, not in so India. <laughs> I'm so happy you brought these up. So these these aren't necessarily from the 17th century, right? Yeah. It's a it's a tradi So this this school of tantric painting. So this isn't neo tantra. I think this is like tantra. Um, there are elements of neo tantra in there, but so they are um, a particular uh, type of painting that comes out of Rajasthan, where it kind of looks like geometric modernist yeah. abstraction, but they are um, made without any of any references to that at all and these artists who are making these paintings aren't thinking of themselves necessarily as artists in the same way that gr santos is or Biren d or agnes pelton or uh, kandinsky they're making them purely because um you know they are tantrikas and they are making them as a byproduct to meditation so, you know, they'll make them so they have something to put on the wall to look at while they meditate. Yeah. I right. always talk about these, you know. So in that way, they're 
they're not made to look at, they're made to look through and you look through them to think about ideas that are much bigger than you. And so, you know, but they, you know, these, we're not quite sure when a lot of these were made. Some of them might've been made really recently. They go, some of these diagrams, which are highly symbolic, you know, this triangle and this circle, like the male energy and the female energy, which is inherent in all of tantric work. Um, you know, some of these might have began as diagrams on 17th century manuscripts. They might have been copied over um, successive generations. There are... Well, like an icon, like, like icons, you know, like Byzantine yeah, icons. They're, they're and replicated, icon. right? Yeah, yeah. Here's yeah. A, one more comparison. Keep it yeah, at pace. Great. Keep it nice. at pace, right? You know, got Those are beautiful. The bursts, which he did in all different sizes, and Gottlieb also did these in um in print print form uh and these you know works which seem to share a real harmony in an abstract expressionist mode with what the tantras were doing what the neo tantras are doing what you're doing uh in the same way and then pared down color sense so you know this is a closely related so, school of art history I but i think it's more together. than that yeah, yeah it's more than that. it's more than just many, visual yeah like not not many people talk about gottlieb when they talk about the abstract expressionist I kind of feel like he's left out a little bit yeah and he was making some of the most phenomenal work I just yeah. think he was incredible but he had a deep interest in you know the the spiritual aspect of his work you know and right. it's not like spiritual with a capital s he's not kind of he's not attempting to preach to anyone or you know it's not about religion right there's a separation needs to be happen needs to happen mm. there it's yeah. about kind of you know using his work to um, discover these like big kind of almost universal ideas that underpin yeah. human nature and he does it in this beautiful um, pared down way right and, th and that sort of universalist quality which I don't know it feels a little bit mocked in art historical circles in recent memory but this show makes you believe, you know, makes you believe in it, that it exists, you know, that the the juxtaposition of the four different artists work, your work, um, it makes it's convincing. I've been back many times. The only thing I don't like hard. about it is the bright white walls, you know, it's it's yeah. some somewhat unkind to your very delicate works. But, you know, the light is good enough. You can see it and, you know, you feel something. I, I have to tell you, my students definitely connected with the work and they didn't know anything about it. You know, it's like the Hilma off Klimt show at um, the Guggenheim where they really didn't make an effort to explain her theology, whatever it was. And it annoyed me at the time, but now I think that that was okay. Maybe we need to come to these works, you know, knowing a little bit, but on our own terms. Yeah, we need to come to them as they are. I think one of the issues with, you know, talking about universalism is, is thinking that everyone is going to get the same experience from the work. And that's kind of the issue with talking about things as universal. But I do think that everyone can have their own experience with this show. And maybe that's, you know, that's different for everyone, which is really important. I think for me, like the idea of universalism is more at the beginning. It's more about like how you approach making work. Um, it's not necessarily the end product. So it's more about like, you know, you can see it in all of these artists that just are from different times, different spaces, different cultural backgrounds, different religions. Somehow there's like some uh, internal code or thing that they're striving for that seems to be like similar. You know, you look at them and like, oh, you were really reaching for the same thing that this artist was reaching for, but you're 50 years apart, you're 200 years apart, or you're a yeah. thousand years apart. Well, we think about, I mean, color, color has a feeling. Yeah. And, a, and, a, and a, a, we have it in association with our bodies. And, you know, color, color is experienced by everyone. And I think that there's, there's, uh, I mean, everyone who can see, um, I think there's a, a relationship I, I'm so I'm so not wanting to say the the word universal. Um, I think the word might be inclusive. You know, like inclusive. It's not, it's and, not exclusivity. It's inclusivity. That's what abstraction right. gives you the possibility for. Right. 
So, you know, red is just this, you know, this rich, fiery, bodily color that we that we use across all cultures to to have that experience. Um, and well, this painting, these paintings here, my split orb series are all about that. They're all about red. I mean, there's yeah. in this painting in particular, it's about uh, just the saturation of red. And these yeah. these are paintings of um, about giving birth. So the top orb is my head and the bottom orb is my belly. And they each painting kind of opens up a little more and the um, the colors change and there's the center the center line of light that kind of mimics my spine the kind of energy of giving birth the kind of it's like a zip. centered yeah it, yeah it's like a cent the centering of giving birth like everything when you're mm. when you're pushing and when you're in a contraction yeah. like everything's radi radiating out of you from this from the center of your from your from your vagina and just like your spine yeah. everything's like tensing up and pulsating and so these paintings are about you know, are about that. Definitely. Last image, because we have to give way to, well, I have to give way to questions from the audience who have been very active in the chat, but I'll leave you with these two details. One uh, on the left is uh, Harmoner's, one of the large paintings uh, with this cleft in it. This is uh, untitled Hair in Hands from 2022. And on the right is um, is Lowy's painting, Pressure in Blue and Red from 2022. I mean, it's a wonderful show. I thank you for sharing the work with us and you know for your selections of uh, work by these predecessors. And I encourage everyone to get there before the 25th and see it in the flesh as you must. Um, thank you both so much. I'm gonna give way to the, to the audience. Appreciate it. Thank you. Can I ask you one question, Jason? Sure. Would you have changed the color of the walls? Because that was brought up to us as an option. <laughs> Absolutely. And we were Absolutely. Just like, no, no, we're not I, doing it. Colored walls always look better for everything. Oh, really? I mean, Interesting. White okay. walls are better than gray walls. Go to Frick Madison now. You'll see how dull. So it you're looks. you're you were into the Pelton blue in the yeah. in the Whitney show. Okay. Yeah, and I'm a okay. Victoria. I I brought up on Victorian art. You can't put Victorian okay. art on white walls. It looks ridiculous. Anyone okay. working with color, white, dark colored walls are the way to go always. Of course, in a gallery like this, it's very difficult because there's so much space, right? So much wall space. Um, but you know, you commune with them in a different way, but that's a story for another, another NSC. It's a bold move. Okay. Yeah. We'll yeah. see. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop the share. Wow, thank you so much, Loie and Harminder and Jason. That was incredible um, and really, really generous. Thank you for sharing so much about your practices and about the show with us. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience. The first is going to be from Fong H. Bowie, our publisher and artistic director at The Rail. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Loie. Thank you, Jason and Harminder. Uh, I usually come to the tail end, but I have to attend to a meeting. So I have to go first. It's a pleasure to congratulate on a beautiful show. And I'm agree with uh, Jason. I can't curate show with white wall anymore. I think the <laughs> idea of the white is no longer appealing, but just want to show, show you, share you with this. Here's my original, Kandinsky. Holy shit. Twelve and uh, Verlag publication. And you can see how beautiful the woodcut is. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the things that I've been collecting in the last 20 something years. But uh, yeah, it's so interesting when uh, Kandinsky wrote his first book, of course, was like that, I just show you 1912. So that was in Russia trying to mediate with Malevich, who soon later became the cultural minister of the visual culture, which everyone fled from him because he became a dictator. But interestingly, when he went to Germany uh, and became part of the Bauhaus, that's when he wrote Point and Line to Plane. So that's 1926. It's interesting to think about that, you know, that bracket of time between his early influence 
by Theosophy, Martin Bolaski, which everybody, he was a member, so was Mondrian and, um, you know, many other people, even Addison was a member of. Um, but I was thinking, you mentioned about transcendentalism, Louis. It's interesting mm -hmm. to, re to remind ourselves that Buckminster Fuller, one of the pr prominent faculty member of Black Mountain College, uh, his great, great aunt was Mark Fuller. Margaret Fuller was the editor in chief, founded the Dial magazine. That was in 1940 with hmm. Emerson. And that magazine was to promote transcendentalist philosophy and poetry hmm. and writing. And, and that exists until 1929, so a long run. And pragmatism, according to William James and John Dewey, came right up on transcendentalism. So the reason I'm bringing all this, partly because I have a lengthy dinner once with Maurice Tuckman, who carried that famous show at LACMA in, I think, 85, 86, I can't remember. But the show was very influential. It's called Abstract Painting in Spirituality, dating from 1890 to 80, 85. It was a mass, massive show. Uh, and what we were talking about was why the progressive movement in the, you know, the late 70s, I mean, mid 70s, really, all the way to the 80s that came, became, as we know of, was New Age spirituality. Remember when occult and metaphysical religious community came together? And the, the book that was very famous, I can't remember, I think it's called The Teaching of Don Juan, is Carlos Costaneda the Korean born archeologist. When I came to America was very big, new age. And the book that I was recommended by my uh, poetry professor was Stephen Berg, was Iron John. You, you, some of you probably heard of it or even read it, Robert Bly. And what is it about new age spirituality that tend to descend everything, derail the certain idea uh, what you we are interested. And the same thing applied to the visual culture. Somehow it found itself in a niche, easy to digest, trivial, and therefore people lost interest in a certain thing that you guys are talking now. So yeah. I just ask both of you from your own perspective, you know, you came to be in your, your richer maturity as an artist and you found this deep connection with that tradition. But why you in search for this, you know, on your own development as, a, as painter, were you aware yeah. of, the, you know, the circumstantial broadness of broader culture beyond the visual culture? In I think for, I, I can, I can take, I can go first. I, I, I didn't think of myself growing up as this new age person, but I grew up in Northern California and my parents were burners, you know, they went to Burning Man and I was surrounded by, my dad was a teacher at UC Davis for many years. So I was surrounded by a lot of the funk artists and there was something just funky and new agey about it, but I didn't, I didn't know that that was a thing. It was just what I grew up around. Um, so yeah, I kind of didn't, I kind of didn't start looking into that in relationship to the art, in relationship to art till I actually found Pelton. But that, that I feel like I, my work is talked about in relationship to like a, a, a new age, like spirituality, but I actually don't, I, it's all coming from my body and my past and my history. No. And um, so I don't, I don't actually know how to talk about it in relationship to my work, except through my body. And I guess that history being in Cal growing up in California kind of comes into it. Yeah. What about what about you? I mean, the I mean, I'm so far away from the New Age movement; it's unreal. Like, <laughs> okay. I just, you know, I didn't grow up with, you know, <laughs> white people in California, like I don't know, doing <laughs> kind of yoga as an exercise. I grew up in the north of England to Sikh parents, and I feel like the new age movement is obviously a bastardization of this ancient philosophical yeah. tradition in India and South Asia, which 
has its roots in like genuine, incredible bodies of knowledge. And so for me, I went through, you know, I grew up in the north of England, you know, I, you know, I'm very British in some ways, but I've visited India like since I was a baby. And I just am really drawn to um, alter alternate bodies of knowledge. And I think we all are becoming more attracted to those things because we're discovering that, you know, in art history, because we're all artists or um, art practitioners in some way, you know, and we're kind of finding out that actually art history is not really art history. It, yeah. There is a particular history that's been talked about and there are alternate bodies of knowledge that artists and philosophers and poets and prose writers have been mining for a long time and so I just think like new age for me, I don't, I don't even know what that is really. I've never encountered it directly. Um, I just know that there were people making artwork who were tapping into bodies of knowledge that were outside of the center. And I think those bodies of knowledge allowed them to think about subversive ideas, alternate ideas, ideas to challenge the mainstream, to challenge like, you know, um, this centralized idea of whatever people think the art world is or philosophical knowledge is. And for me, it's a way to challenge all of that. So that's why I'm, I'm really drawn to it. Um, well, that's a terrific answer. And I just want to um, mention when Jason spoke briefly about the, the uh, you know, a clean show at MoMA, I mean, at Guggenheim in 2018, uh, yeah. According to everyone there told me that it was the most attended show in the last 20 years of the museum. Well, wow. so I think it's resurgent. It came back. That's one thing we love about art. You know, it always finds its way to come back. It's yeah. like, yeah. you know, the, the, the movement of butterfly somewhere in Texas can set up a tornado somewhere in Brazil. You know, it's terrific. So thank you, you guys. Congratulations on a beautiful show. And thank you, Jason. Please go to the show. And uh, back to you, Chloe. <laughs> thank you for the question. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fong. Um, the next question is going to come from GE. GE, um, you can unmute now. Yes, Fong, Fong touched upon much of what I was going to ask, but I have a, a different way of phrasing something else that I'm very, very curious about both for, for Loi and, and Harbinger, and, and thank you, Jason, for bringing this to us. Um, the show, to me, for just a small amount of time I've had to look at this, 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 the, the, the show um, here today seems to, to sort of prompt a kind of emergence, not in an esoteric, super esoteric, um, you know, new age way, but then also these works seem to want to help us to escape self-defeating paradoxes. Is there anything to this read at all? Uh, we have to so, describe more. Yeah, can you say that again? Self defeat. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. sure. I, re, I just re think, word it. Oh well, yeah. I I think I think a lot of times um, we're kind of stuck in our conditionings, and and the paradoxes that we often see that that pull us this way and that, and this seems to in some ways. To my mind, and again, this is just my reading, these seem to help us coalesce the things, to bring things back together again, to kind of, you know, put things back together and give and give things more of a, a continuation and continuity. And, I think um, that we, oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, I think, you know, what I was talking about before, these works come, I, I, I don't know, I have to ask Harmander if he feels the same, but these works come as a therapeutic experience for both of us. And I think, Again, when things come from such an honest place, um, they, sorry, I'm losing my, my train of thought, but they, they, um, <laughs> you should take over. <laughs> well, they're authentic and they connect with people. That's what it is, right? Right. It's, and they bring us along with them. That's what I yeah. was thinking. Yeah, right. It's, commu it's communal. The, it's communal. That's the happy. Possibly. I feel like that's a happy accident because they are made, you know, primarily for, you know, experiencing and, and 
therapeutic for me, you know, creating a therapeutic experience that then perhaps becomes therapeutic for others. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I definitely, um, my current body of work that I've been making since 2017, I made without knowing if anyone would ever look at it. And, you know, I was outside of the art world for years, you know, I can, had a career as a performance artist and then was just tired and exhausted and poor and like just fucking fed up of it. And, you know, I, I didn't think I'd ever come back to the art world. And I came back to it by going back to art school and just trying to find some meaning in my life through making things. It's really that honest and that simple. And I didn't know if anyone was ever going to look at it. But the more I did that, the more I was compelled to, to do that, the more people started knocking on the door yeah. and being like, oh, I vibe with that or I feel that or I whatever. And, you know, it's not to belittle any other way of art making. You know, I've got friends who are incredibly socially engaged practitioners who make work that's deeply political and of them, you know, and, and, and it's not to belittle any of that. It's just there's enough room in the in the art world which is much bigger than we think it is to make to make work and I think that's okay and you know as long as you're making it from a place of some compulsion I think then whatever like it's it's cool like just do it I think it's really interesting too that Santosh and Pelton both entered their work these yeah. bodies of work from that place yeah of just doing it for themselves, you know, really yeah, I mean, tuned Pelton, into their own emotional space. Yeah, I mean, Pelton had success, right? As an early, uh, she was in this like armory show and stuff that, you know, and she was taught by the guy, what's he called? The guy who also taught Georgia O'Keeffe and she had this early success and then she kind of had this, you know, she moved away from it and had kind of a uh, an aesthetic and spiritual reawakening and then made this incredible work in the desert, which she didn't, you know, she sold very little of. I don't think many people saw it in her lifetime. And then she was forgotten about for a long time. But I'm convinced that that work meant more to her than anything she'd made before, any landscape or portrait or whatever, or anything she made at the Pratt Institute or, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just think as an artist, that's so um, inspirational because you're like, okay, you know, when, I don't know, when you don't think the world is listening and you go internally, you find things with inside, inside yourself that vibe with other people. And they're also kind of looking at, musicians do it all the time, filmmakers do it all the time, and sometime, uh, sometimes artists do it. And then it can be universal in some way, even though that's a bit of a dirty word. Wow. Thank you so much for those thank answers, you. Chloe and Harminder. And thank you for that question, GE. Um, thank you so much to everyone uh, for your questions and for this Q&A. Um, at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome Leia Dorkin to the stage. Leia Dorkin is a writer living in New York. Her stories have been published in Fence, Best American Experimental, Bomb, Hotel, and Elsewhere. She's currently working on a short story collection and a novel. She's a contributing editor at Bomb, and she has an MFA from Columbia University. Welcome, Leia. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I was excited to read. I write stories that are often portal stories, and I really loved this show. So I was especially excited to read along with this beautiful work. I'm going to read the beginning of a new story um, that's unpublished. It's called The Flare. One afternoon, my fat husband stopped polishing his crystals, got up off his lazy boy, opened our front door, walked straight out into that rectangular portal of white light and never came back. I expect he settled into the subtle you of some other woman's worn upholstery and is probably not too far away, though I have little interest in finding him. I only wish he took his crystals with him. His collection is massive and sprawling. Rocks clog up the living room, 
Prismatic labradorites green over when you walk past them. Rudely splayed purple amethysts take up half the seats of our sectional. A hunk of golden pyrite sits on the piano bench. Don't even get me started on the quartzes, which come in so many colors and varieties, it seems like a geologist made an unfunny joke by calling them the same name. I only know these names because I was subject to so many years of dinners across the table from my husband. There was little else he cared to talk about. Oh, do you know about the blah blah, he'd say? The blah diddy blah it blah it says? You should see the gleamer on top of the TV. It glares at you, dense with light, a bulbous nose protruding from its translucent face. It's only ever about crystals with him, and to put it quite simply, I hate them. I never thought I'd end up with my husband, or at least no version of my past self would have ever chosen to spend such a large percentage of her future beside him. But that, choice, it is not how love works. As a young woman, I imagined a perfect choice would one day materialize in the shape of a man. When this choice presented itself, it would be so ideal that it'd almost be disabling. I'd find myself strolling the horizon beside him, entwined in that beachy dimension where lovers go. The feeling would be extraterrestrial compared to everything I knew of human desire up until the point of meeting his face. But love is not like that, not really. Circumstances set you up for the conveniences that follow, and you end up how and where you end up, held together by the security of a routine. The patterns you fall into that make it easier to get through life. Once the arrangement between my husband and I was decided, settling into our finite status was a relief. It eliminated questions, and I've never been a fan of questions. Questions do not relax me. As a child, I was taught that love was everything. The generation who taught me that lie are all dead now. Their silly ideas brought a lightness to life, though the advice they gave was consistently irrelevant and never did much good at all. It was sure something to witness how an entire adult generation took the fictitious mythologies seated in their own childhoods and let it morph into what they called wisdom. I guess I'm more of a realist, nothing like the people who came before me, all frivolously drunk on the dram of history, perverted by Hollywood. I've never been a religious person. I'm not the sort to get moved by poetry or folk music or any other kind of fabricated magic. For three weeks now, I've lived alone. Many of the crystals are very large and I hardly have the body to carry them down the basement steps or to bury them back where they belong. Where they belong is deep in darkness, tucked in a bed of dirt. Up here, the crystals make rainbows. Horrible, colorful orbs appear on the walls throughout the day dancing shapes that disappear, figments that mock me. Finally, to make it stop, I covered up each rock with a dirty rag. The living room looks like a shrine for stains. I felt a kind of peace in the house once my husband was gone. There was nothing that could go wrong, really. It was so quiet at dinners, I could hear myself sipping a spoonful of soup. I could have leftovers all week and no one would glare at me expectantly, crystalline eyes hungry for the next new taste. I could leave the shower and walk to the bedroom without a robe, my nakedness invisible. My home was, for the first time, mine. I was in the middle of a hot shower and slippery with soap when everything changed. The power went out, the shower water stopped. Outside, it was a black night and the total darkness was immediate. The spectrum of sound that I'd grown accustomed to entirely switched. Without the buzzing of light or the humming of refrigeration, there was an uncomfortable amount of sound, though I couldn't fully identify what the sound was that replaced the pale vibrations of motors. Exiting the shower, I tripped on a vanished slipper and fell on my hip. I couldn't get up. The pain shot through my body in a broken way and I could feel an unbearable tenderness deep in the bone of my pelvis. It was a bone I'd never known, not until it was broken. This is why I was not supposed to live alone, I thought, cursing myself on the cold floor, trying to ascertain if the pool around me was soapy water, blood, or both. From the cold tiles, I could hear the wind, an angry broom sweeping the spaces between the man-made structures, forcefully brushing through and bringing bits and pieces of debris along with it. Who would try to come and find me? The mutant who mowed the lawn? The chimney sweep who was scheduled to come five days later to clean the flue? It seemed that even if the lights could go on and how I wished they would, 
I might be stuck on the floor only now in their harsh brightness with no one to help move me. This was my fault. I should have pretended harder to care about my husband's crystals, to let the fatty plug me on occasion when he asked politely. I could have so easily left my nightgown on and looked the other way, two simple things that could have made all the difference in the world from my vantage point on the bathroom floor. The heat had gone off and I was starting to feel the temperature of the outside air. Being so nude and wet in the winter was starting to worry me. It wasn't fear. I had already made a point of not being afraid of death. My mother was dead, my father was dead. I had a sister who died practically the moment she'd been born and I always assumed she was doing just fine, that maybe she was even the luckier sister. I was not afraid of death. I'd grown up happily sunbathing in graveyards and once in the academy, I'd attended a lecture with a professor who right in front of us all dissembled a cadaver. My husband, who was not yet then my husband, but a long haired collegiate who needed to borrow the notes of a brighter pupil for next week's exam, gasped when the lungs were set aside on a plexiglass tray. He uncontrollably trembled when the heart was plucked away from its casket like a wild dripping instrument. Oh, how I'd laughed at him. I remember it to this day, how I saw the fear dumb his face. I can't say how long I lay there. Time stops in the darkness. I didn't miss my husband, but I wished I'd been better to him, if only so he could pick me up and drive me to a medical facility. After so many dutiful years, I at least deserved to be lifted and rolled to a waiting room. How many butter chickens had I perfectly roasted while he, with his feet kicked up, researched the turquoise blooms found in Ritalik magma? I could see them now, barns full of prickly chickens I'd repetitively tendered myself, flocks of shaved armpits resting in refrigeration, while my husband was between worlds in the living room, muttering to himself about volcanic domes. How many breasts had I carved and plated while he hypnotically stared into the file, fire opal's flare? Even as he was sat down and chewing, you could see it behind his dull brown eyes, reflections of the hot neon core. Our living room is directly beneath the upstairs bathroom where I lay stuck, and below the barrier of our floor, I could still sense their obtrusive forms draining the darkness of its charge. Why did I have such a deep hatred for those fancy rocks? Even in my wrecked state, I wondered, since I had nothing to do but wonder. I hated how he searched to find them, collected them, arranged them, how he tended to them. Most of all, I hated having to witness his belief in beauty. Like gazing at an object would bounce the beauty back into him. Being a witness to someone who still believed was painful. I thought of my dead mother in her tattered cantaloupe dress, always singing in the garden as if her plants were ears. But the vision of my mother half cast in the round shade of her straw brim brimmed singing, partial renditions of sultry torch songs warmed me. I had loved her despite her silliness or maybe because of it, for the escape it offered me from, her faded, from the faded chicken filled tunnel of my own future. I played along in the splash, splash of her naive joy until beeping green peaks became a droning flat line. My husband's preoccupation was not like my mother's. There was something so misplaced about his obsessive admiration. He joined a lineage of men who'd been collecting beauty as if it was theirs to take all along. My hand brushed upon something round and waxy, the scalloped bar of pink hand soap, its ridges rounded from morning after morning of my two hands washing. It must have slipped to the floor as I did. Instinctively, I brought it to my nose. The roses were synthetic and compressed, the smell a ghost of its former flower. But in the desperation for something, I huffed it, inhaling faint rose after faint rose, while the voice in my head seemed to sing in the way my mother once had, the earth, the earth, the earth. I'll stop there. Thank you. Leia, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, that was so, so brilliant. Thank you. Um, and thank you again to Loi. Thank you, Harminder. Thank you, Jason. Thank you to all of you for your amazing questions and for joining us today. Thank you as well to Emily and the team at PACE for their support in preparing for today's event. And we'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation who sponsor our NSC program and make daily conversations like this one possible. They also support our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For 22 years, the Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like this program, our daily NSC. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support the Rail. And if you're free on Monday, 
We're offering a screening of Hans Hock for decades in partnership with Michael Blackwood Productions on President's Day. And as is real tradition, you can now turn on your microphone and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks everybody for Thank coming. You so much. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lowy. Thank you, Harminder. Thank you, go have a Thank go you. have a pint of special on for me, Harminder. I miss it. The real beer. <laughs> Thanks to my parents for coming as ever. I'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye. Bye guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Leia. That was that was special. Awesome. Good More fiction. Again.